Hello and welcome to another episode of the Haskin Cast Podcast. I am your host, Scott Haskin. And man, I am so excited to bring you guys this review and a bonus interview. What happened was uh, when I was speaking with Michelle, the singer of Arapaxis, we were kind of jumping around a little bit. So we didn't get to all the songs because their power went out in Montreal. And, you know, it's always a challenge to do non-face-to-face interviews. I've done them all over the world. And it's amazing sometimes that the the difference in clarity, the difference in sound quality, uh, just the difference in uh, time and all those things really play into what happens. And in this case, there happened to be a power outage right in the middle. So uh, I did get a bit of an interview with Michelle, which I'm going to play for you guys in a couple of moments. And we've got some feedback from her on some of the songs as well. Uh, Also worked with Jerry when I did his interview, and we talked about the individual songs. So I've got some clips to play from him as we go through the album. This is the album Water Dog. It is a fantastic album. My first experience with the band, they have just been absolutely fantastic to work with and uh, getting to interview them, uh, especially David Stone. You know, I've been listening to David Stone's work for years and to get to talk to him about it was just amazing. Unfortunately, David and I have not had a chance to reschedule our continuing interview. So uh, I do not have his feedback on the individual songs, but I'm sure that we'll discuss that when I get to uh, sit down and chat with him again. Uh, I know that he was uh, he was glad to work on the album and he really contributed some pretty amazing stuff to it. So uh, good stuff coming. Also, on a side note, if you guys did listen to my interview with David, um, he talked about a YouTube video of a show that he did with Max Webster at the Barry Theater in Canada. And I did put that link in the show notes. I have checked out the show. Oh, my God. I totally see what he was saying about the performance. Um, I thought it was a fantastic show. Really good progressive stuff. If that's the kind of music that you're into, man, check it out. Check it out. Go to uh, you either go to the show notes for uh, that interview that I did with him last week, or uh, just go onto YouTube, type in Max Webster Barry Theater B A R R I E, and the show will come up. There's a couple of different versions on there. I think the one I put in the show notes was the one that said best quality. I was just amazed at how good the audio sounded. I mean, it really, really came through well. It was very well mixed. And I'm just so used to, you know, looking at older concert footage, I I just kind of expect the audio is not going to be that great. And I was really pleasantly surprised. So on top of a great performance, a very well shot video, you've got really good sound quality too. So um, really good stuff. Go check that out if uh, if you like that kind of stuff. And, you know, it's really similar to this album too. It's, it's um, you know, very progressive, lots of stuff going on, just uh, pushing a lot of limits. So Um, I would think that if you're into this album or into that show, you're going to be into the other one, whichever way you want to look at it. Um, So uh, just a a very, very quick update on me. It looks like I am going to have to delay the release of my album um, as I've been working on the bass guitar tracks. Um, Haven't even gotten to the drums yet, but as I've been working on the bass guitar tracks, I am finding it is very difficult with my uh, shoulder injury to get the tracks done as quickly as I normally would. I'm still able to do them. Um, I'm very happy with the performances I've done so far. I just have to go about them a little bit differently uh, in in the approach, and that takes a little bit longer to get things done. But I'm not going to release anything that I don't think is absolutely ready to go, and I'm excited to bring that to you. And I also have at least one guest on the album. We'll see how the rest plays out. But so far, um, I I did something I rarely do, which is a collaboration. And I think it came out fantastic. I think the song is 10 times better for it. So I'm very excited to uh, get the album out to you guys when I can. Hopefully, um, you know, still in the early fall area. I just want to make sure that it's the best that I can deliver before I actually put it out there. And I know that my editor is working on my book trilogy. So I am going to have to put the album on pause to get that done, because as I've said, there is a much bigger time crunch on the book series than there is on the album as far as when I can release it. So all those things in mind, um, it is still on the way. I promise you guys, um, whatever I have to do to get it done, I will do. And that's just the way I the way I, I work things. But let's get to Arapaxes, this album, Water Dog, and what, how it all came together. Here, I'm going to play my interview with Michelle McPherson. She is the singer of the band. Also in the band, as you know, we have Jerry Fielden. He was the lead guitarist. He does some synth work, also plays the mandolin, did the drums and backing vocals. Uh, Michelle McPherson does the lead vocals. 
We have Gene Audette, who is on bass guitar and backing vocals. Of course, David Stone on keyboards. And Gwendolyn, I hope I'm saying this right, Kresnicki. And if that's not actually right, I apologize, Gwendolyn. But you played the violin, viola, and did some backing vocals as well. Uh, So uh, we're going to get to Michelle's interview right now. Here it is. All right, ladies and gentlemen, I am really blessed with this band because not only do I absolutely love this album and their music, but I'm getting to know what great and wonderful people they are on top of it, which always makes me really happy when I listen to a band to know that I like the people as well as the music they put out. And speaking of cool people on this album, we have the vocalist Michelle McPherson with us. Michelle, how are you? I'm very well, thank you. Uh, Now, how was it that you discovered that you could sing like this lovely angel, but you could also sing like a demon from the third level of hell? (laughs) Um, Well, it kind of started when uh, Jerry was making a previous album with Our Patches uh, at home with him on his 12 truck, whatever machine it was at the time. And I would go in there and I would turn down the vocals or if they hadn't been recorded then it was fine and I would just like sing along not taking it too seriously um just because I I was hearing these songs all the time you know he's playing them and he's recording and so I kind of I knew them um but I wasn't taking it as seriously as now so it just started out as a little like a fun thing to do and when the time came that having gone through the process of auditioning and having them learn the songs, uh, he he turned to me and said, "Well, maybe you could be the singer. You know, you you know the songs. Um, we could get you some vocal um, lessons, vocal coaching, and whatnot." And that's kind of how it started out. So for for me, it just kind of grew from there. I love when things happen organically like that, though, because it's it's not that you set out to do something. You just kind of fell into it by the enjoyment of doing it. Yes, that's right. Yeah, that's always the best for me. I, I find that that if I'm if I'm trying too hard to do something as opposed to just letting things happen naturally, it usually comes out uh, not as good as if I would just let things develop. So I, I love that. But how did you find the growlish voice? Um, I really don't remember so much it's just again something that there was there was some of that in the the band at the time Mm -hmm. um and i just started copying what the previous singer was doing and finding how how it worked and what parts of the voice to use so that you don't end up with sore throat etc etc it's just something that i can i can do it's it's there it's in my like arsenal of things to do with it I can do with my voice mm-hmm. oh. it's pretty amazing I, I I was really shocked by not just the the sound of it but how powerful it is in in you know your speaking voice is so gentle uh it, it it kind of makes it even more interesting for me that you can sing with that kind of power um but do you find that you're doing things differently as far as taking care of your voice um to just keep up the ability to do it than you were before you started singing oh yeah Definitely. Um, I know there's a lot of things you can't eat or drink or you you really shouldn't just to try and keep it um, healthy and go through like, vocal warm ups and warm downs and things to keep it healthy. So, yeah, I, I do think to, to keep it um, in shape. That's good. That's so important. And I, I think about a lot of singers while they're used to being on tour and not being on tour and having to do something to maintain their voice so that when things open up, they they don't, you know, pass out from just not having that energy anymore. So I'm glad you're keeping up on it. Have you done any live shows with the band? I uh, yes, I've done. Well, I joined in 2013. So off the top of my head, I'm going to say may, I've done maybe five or six shows, maybe maybe more than that. But um, it's always fun to play with um with jerry and we usually have a sort of revolving door of musicians especially drummers (laughs) we are difficult people (laughs) but uh, we've had our current bass player for a while while now and he's uh he's really good and really 
he brings a lot uh, musically to uh, the recording. Well, that's good. Do you find it that it's easy to get through a whole show? Because when you're when you're not used to performing, that's a long time to be singing. Uh, yeah, it, it can it can be quite tough. I mean, we, we don't usually play. Uh, we're not usually like um, doing like a headline spot or uh, whatever. We've usually just opened for people like um, Lily John Roth and Blaze Bailey of Iron Maiden. So wow. we usually are allotted to maybe 45 minutes. So it's not really that a long time to, to be performing and to be singing. But um, when it comes to our, our launches, like the shows we play to launch the albums, we do play for a lot longer, and that can be pretty tough on the voice at the end of the night. Yeah, I would think so. But it, it, it sounds like you're getting some really good gigs opening up for those people. Yeah, they were really um, nice and coachable, especially Blaze Bailey. He was welcoming to, his, to, to us and to fans. You know, when he finished playing, he sat around for... He was in the bar for a while, just chatting to people and signing autographs, taking pictures. So he was really, really nice. Oh, I like that. I, I like when people care about their fans enough to to make that work. Yeah. Was it? How was it for you though? The first time that you went out, was it? Were you nervous? Was it like, uh, hey, I just want to do this. I'm going to have fun. How, how did you feel? Um, the first show I played, it was, it was very uh, nerve wracking for me because. It wasn't an environment that I was, I'd was i been in before, even though, you know, I'd, we'd been rehearsing and practicing for the months leading up to the show. But to be actually on stage and having to sort of say, look, this is this is my band, um, we're our patches, um, and, and speak to the audience and get the audience involved, uh, that was definitely a um, nerve-wracking thing for me which is something I'm still kind of working on a lot is like trying to speak to the audience thing all this <laughs> to get it over with kind of thing but just to to talk to them and get them introduce the bands and be um be a be, kind of better uh front woman you know and that's really a smart thing to to work on because uh engaging the crowd musically is one thing but engaging them in between and you know, that's that's a different level of uh, expectation from a band. Did did you experience anything like be, really becoming aware of your physical presence? A little bit like, you know, like I have to I have to do something, you know, there's there's eyes on me kind of thing. Mm -hmm. I have to do something and hope I don't, like you know, tri trip up or fall over or something, you know, but and just to sing at the same time and know that people are, are watching you. That was very uh nerve-wracking for me yes <laughs> very good well i'm i'm hoping that you guys will get to do some shows after this uh pandemic is all over i know that some bands are already out touring like the dead daisies are just in full tour in the united states right now and um it's kind of weird it just seems like uh at least uh in the states that it's just over like it never happened how is it in your area um it's still uh pretty um tight uh, restrictions you know there's there's not many live shows going on if any at all <laughs> um still you know wear wear masks everywhere keep distance um so there isn't really much music happening um but as we're we're you know we're in summer and people are, are trying to to open up and get back to some kind of normal um way of be living but it's still very tough um, here. Yeah. I think the thing is that I'm more concerned with is that we're just doing too much too fast to go to, okay, we're 60% vaccinated or whatever. Let's just open this up to 100,000 people at a concert again. And um, I, I'm just afraid it's a little too much too fast, but hopefully not. Hopefully we'll we'll get back to normal soon and you guys can go out and play. Yes. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I, I think um, both Jerry and I feel like, yeah, it's, it's a little too much too soon. Mm hmm even though you know people are vaccinated and stuff, it just um, we still have to be very precautious. Very much so. I, I I say let's play it smart for a little bit longer, and uh, and and get out of this thing once and for all. Let's talk about the album because I love Water Dog. I was so pleasantly surprised. I hadn't heard anything from you guys prior to that, so this was my first introduction to your band, and I was just blown away by how good this album was. 
And um, starting with the, the, even just from the beginning of the champ, I thought, wow, this has a great sound to it. I'm really anxious to see what these guys can do. And I was just absolutely blown away. Uh, is it still exciting to you or has it kind of just like found its place in your brain? Um, it's, it's still re- quite exciting um, because, to be honest, I really haven't listened to it all that much since mm-hmm. finished in recording which I think is something that a lot of musicians do. It's like you're so kind of tired of hearing those songs over and over again while you're recording. You kind of just put it to one side once it's released. But mm-hmm. it's, I have listened to it a couple of times and it has, it's it's a lot of um, good, uh, strong, like straight ahead kind of rock, but also with uh, Jerry's love of um, progressive and off beats and off timings it's um it's definitely something different there's uh there's something for everyone i guess on the album but we are trying to steer it towards more of a kind of straight ahead rock but again with the progressive uh tinges and things like that sure and and i think you've nailed that Uh, And you're absolutely right. Uh, Myself included, I'm working on an album right now. And as soon as it's done, I'm probably not going to listen to it for a good year, at least. (laughs) So I I, I could definitely empathize with you on that. What's ahead for you? Are you planning on um, continuing with with the band and being part of the next album? I, yeah. Uh, Jerry has just put down sort of like sort of bare bones foundations for a new, uh, new track for the next album. I'm looking forward to singing on that also. Whenever whenever the um, inspiration hits him, I'm sure he's going to come out with some wonderful music, as he always does. No doubt about that. I do have one more question for you, uh, if you don't mind. I'm curious, when you're in your recording sessions, what is it that you drink to keep your throat going? Um, It's usually either water or um, lemon and honey in hot water which is very very soothing and very relaxing but also keeps the vocal cords hydrated and you can go for for longer if you need to take make takes after takes after take it's not going to be too tiring on the voice do you tend to work uh where you take uh you know you do a little bit and then you take a break and you come back and do a little more or do you just like go for the whole song uh we we do break it up a lot we sometimes will do a, a verse, even if we have to go line by line, record each line on its own, then we will, which can take a long time. But if you're if you're getting a, a good product at the end, but I don't think I've ever did like a, a full song in one take or a couple of takes. We usually do break it down just so that we can get the best for each each line and then jerry works his studio magic and makes it sound great (laughs) so that's where we got cut off uh the power went out unfortunately in montreal or at least in their uh part of montreal i spent uh, a really cool few days up there shortly before christmas one year my friend uh, miriana and her daughter una had me over um, when i was living in arizona And we just had a blast doing Christmas shopping and being out in the snow, um, actually getting a real Christmas tree. It was so much fun. And that was in the town of Otremont. And Otremont is this really nice little, think of, uh, if you're familiar with the show, um, uh, what was the, was it Andy Griffiths? Was that the name of the show? I think so. I think that was the name of the actual show, wasn't it? Not just the character. Well, anyway, think about Mayberry and think about how you know, there's one person running the bakery that you know that the the lady that cashes you out is also the one that baked everything. You know, just that that kind of really hometown um, mom and pop shop, but the whole town. And um, of course, you know, there's there's regular chain businesses and stuff too. But in the area that I was in, it was mostly mom and pop shops, um, bookstores, cafes, restaurants, all kinds of just really neat stuff. I really loved the bakery there. But for me, living in Arizona for so many years, it was really nice to go back and just kind of experience snow again. Um, There was one day where there was actually it was the day before I was leaving. There was quite a blizzard and I was worried whether I was going to be able to get back home or not. But just to sit in the windowsill, watch the snowfall, just see the glow of the lights in the town, um, go 
you know, pick up a real Christmas tree. It was just so much fun, but I really liked the town. I really liked that um, non-corporate feel that it had. Of course, I live in Vegas, which you're not going to get a whole lot of that, uh, especially post-COVID, but um, yeah, I like where I live. Anyway, let's get to the first song on the album. I'm going to start by playing the album track, a little piece of the album track, as I always do. Then we're going to get into the sound clips and my thoughts on each song. And the very first song on the album is called The Champ. So what are your thoughts on The Champ? Well, The Champ was basically a song I've been uh, wanting to redo uh, for a long time. It's a song with my band Riser in Toronto. And uh, it took a while, but I got the uh, other writer on the song's permission to do it. Uh, the ex-bass player, Alan Park, who is also a member of the Royal Canadian Air Force. So wow. he's a stand-up comic. He's really funny. Huh. Uh so yeah, we were to, uh, he was in our band back then. So this is around 84, 85. Mm -hmm. uh, and I decided to, you know, redo it because I liked it. And uh, Michelle wanted to do it. So we did, uh, we re-recorded it. Uh, I basically kept the guitar more chunky than the original. The more, it was more arpeggios before. And then I just chunky chords instead. And Dave came in like a ton of bricks with the organ there doing the basically the same thing. Like the way we recorded the, most of the songs, we started with the champ there, was that uh, my guitar, you will notice, is on the right side and Dave's keyboards is on the left side. Mm -hmm. So almost a live setup. Uh, there's very little uh, rhythm guitar overdubs uh, on that song. There's, I believe there's none. Oh. Uh, yeah, it's just a guitar and organ in rhythm, and plus the the lead breaks, of course, the mm -hmm. solos. Yeah, and uh, yeah, so uh, it, the song is about a boxer, small town boxer, you know, the champ, mm -hmm. and uh, you know how he trains and practices. He wants to be the best, you know, and then he finally gets the the belt of gold, like I say. And but how long do you think he'll rule? You know, right. how long is he going to stay the champ? So that that was the idea behind that, you know. I, I had watched a few boxing matches, like Ali Fraser, all the classics there. Mm -hmm. uh, so that idea came from there. There's a couple of really stunning guitar solos in that song too, and a violin as well. Yeah, oh, the violin is uh, amazing. She is so good, Gwen. I tell you. Yeah, it was very. It was a very emotional solo for for a piece like that. I thought. It uh, it blended really nicely, even though it shouldn't work. Yeah, well, I like to try things that shouldn't work, and they work. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> well, yeah. uh, Gillen, what are your and thoughts on this? Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Yeah, and and of course, like uh, we had Gillen there on the back vocals. Yeah. So you is. wanted to? Uh, yeah, here he is. It's just fun to like. It's fun to be in the studio, you know, doing like the voices, retrying mm -hmm. and retrying. Sure. So you get like the perfect voice. This boy has perfect pitch, by the way. One in ten thousand kids. Oh, yeah, that's yeah. amazing. Yeah. Do you do you enjoy it, or do you feel pressure if you don't nail it the first time? Is it is it kind of uh, daunting at any, at any point? It's somewhere in the middle. Mm -hmm. Um, or maybe less. Maybe maybe not like ten tons of crushing force, but like a pound or two. <laughs> well, that's okay. <laughs> That's not so bad. Yeah. Very cool. But you, but you, you have good memories of, of your time recording it. Mm hmm. Excellent. He's, yeah. He's recorded about three songs so far. Mm -hmm. Nice. And is it, is music a direction you want to head in? So, so like one, two, three, four, five fingers turning. 
Okay. He's not sure, <laughs> in other words. Well, that's okay. You got plenty of time to decide. No worries there at all. And we have a Hammond organ in the living room. Oh, nice. It's sounding gnarly like uh, Deep Purple. <laughs> Do you have the Leslie's too? No, I got a Leslie pedal, uh, like a simulator. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I run it through a Marshall. When uh, when I interviewed Ken Hensley, he said that uh, if he never had to haul another Leslie speaker for the rest of his life, he'd be perfectly <laughs> happy. <laughs> well, yeah, those things are huge. But even the organs, like 400 pounds, it's a CV. Mm-hmm. It's like the... Uh, the one before the C2 and the C3 was right. called the CV, made between uh, 1945 and 49. It's in great condition. Somebody just gave it to me. Wow. And that's got that's got to have that really gritty blue sound to it. Oh, yeah. yeah. I mean, it's the same as it's like the early version of John Lord's and Keith mm-hmm. Emerson's, basically. Wow. Mm-hmm. What a yeah. beautiful piece of machinery right there. Yeah. So I'll just uh, say goodbye to Gillen. Oh, Bye. Okay. Bye, Gillen. Thank you. Uh, yeah, um, stuff. Bye. <laughs> I'm glad we got to add him in. That was nice. That was pretty fun, wasn't it? And uh, let's hear what Michelle had to say about the song. Thinking about the opening track, The Champ, uh, do you have any thoughts on that one? Well, that was a track that uh, Jerry recorded with his band in the 80s called Riser, mm-hmm. the, uh, the Champ. And Jerry's vocals were so amazing and so gnarly on it i guess he wanted to see if i could do my own kind of take on those those vocals and uh hopefully i have done it just justice and oh yeah yeah. (laughs) it's uh definitely one of uh our my favorites and also jerry's uh yeah it's just it's a it's a good opener i believe and with also the the added uh keyboard um parts from david stone it really that gave it it's a new kind of flavoring from the original so and for me uh personally my thoughts on the song were i really liked it um i i was very surprised i didn't really know what to expect from this band um i had just uh, seen the post on twitter uh talked to jerry back and forth a little bit and said uh, you know i'd really love to interview you guys and and review the album and it just came came about but when I actually sat down to listen to the album, this being my first song uh, experience with them, I was really pleasantly surprised. Um, I thought the vocals were just really unexpected. I thought it had a great sound um, on all the instruments. Um, I liked the even writing on the crash, which I don't normally like for long periods of time. Um, but I like what was done here. It was uh, it was prominent in the mix, but not overbearing, which is really important for me because that constant cymbal sound can really just drown out a lot of frequencies. Um, the song's kind of mellow, but it's not at the same time, which is what I thought was really interesting about it. But, you know, for an album opener and for my introduction to the band, I was very pleasantly surprised by the song. Uh, next up, we have a song called Return of the Light. And this has a very interesting keyboard part in it that, um, well, you just have to hear it. But first, we're going to hear the opening of the song. got a really good heavy edge to it, doesn't it? Now we're going to talk, uh, Jerry and I will talk about the keyboard part that I just love so much. And I'm just going to play a little snippet of it right here for you.
Yeah, I really love that part. Um, just these little bursts of, of synth sound on top of that guitar it just sounds so good to me. I When I first heard that, I had to rewind it and just hear it again because I thought it just sounded so good to my ears. But let's see what Jerry had to say about the song. So let's talk about Return to the Light. I, I love how beefy the snare sounds on this song. That's that snare I was telling you about, the, the Gretsch, Gretsch there. Mm-hmm. Like the, the hammered metal. Uh, it's just... I actually used it on pretty well all the songs of that album. In the last three albums, I've been using that snare because it's just like so powerful, Mm -hmm. you know? It is. Uh, And uh, yeah, Return of the Light. Return of the Light is a song I wrote in 1978. Mm. And, uh, you know, I was playing it live with uh, a a half covers band I had at at that time called Nightwatch. We had some... uh, pretty good musicians in there and we did you know covered foreigner and stuff like that and uh that song was like had a kind of a slightly middle eastern feel because of the you know harmonic minor scale that Mm -hmm. was used and uh i said oh this time you know i i'm gonna record it very raw that one has two guitars on it so that one is definitely two guitars uh they're very well synced and uh I just go into the fifth when I'm doing that, uh, you know, that Middle Eastern riff. Mm -hmm. Uh, So, yeah. And uh, Dave comes in and does some synth solos in there. Really cool stuff. Well, I got to talk to you about that because, well, first of all, one of the notes that I had written down was Egyptian feel. I I absolutely love that. Uh, But when I heard this part with the guitar and the keyboards, this was the first one I had to go back and count. And it's in 5-4. This is just, it comes out of nowhere, but it's one of the most amazing things I've ever heard in a piece of music. Thank you. Was that Make sure to tell. Oh, I will. Make sure to tell Dave that. (laughs) (laughs) How did that, was that his idea, your idea? How did that come about? Uh, That was me. That's not in the original version of the song. Mm. I just said, oh, I'm going to do this run just to go up to, to, you know, shake things up a little bit. Mm -hmm. And it came out like that. And then I... Dave decided to add synth to that. And wow, you know. Well, and I think the particular tone that he chose really made a big difference on there. It would have sounded good if he used an organ or a piano, but that particular synth, it's like kind of like a brassy buzzsaw synth. It just, yeah, so good. it's amazing. It just brings out so much more. Oh yeah. It's, uh, I was impressed with that sound. Definitely. I went, wow, this makes the song, you know? Yeah, that with the Egyptian feel, I think, really, uh, really brought me in on that one. Yeah, yeah. And this was way before Power Slave and stuff like that Mm -hmm. with the same kind of riff. Right. Yeah. No. And and it's it's amazing, too, I have to say, because some of these songs are are so much older. Um, They really all fit together very well. The album is very cohesive. I would not have guessed that there was such a distance in the writing. Oh, yeah. And I got early songs like that in some other albums as well. Very cool. I love that. Just reach back into the past saying, oh, I used to love this song. Let's do it. You know, sure. I can do anything you want, really. Oh, exactly. Yeah. That's the beauty of being an artist. And here's what Michelle had to say about the song. Return of the Light. And I I love the sound. I love the Egyptian feel on this one. Did that add a, a challenge for you at all? I don't think so um i think this this again is an older uh, track uh from jerry's uh previous band when he had in the uh, 70s and you know he if he hears one of his older tracks um and he said to me you know you would sound pretty good on this um i don't think he would put forward a song that would present too many challenges or wasn't in my range or something like that so i think he thought that my voice would uh, make a good fit for this song and so it wasn't uh, it wasn't too challenging um to record well the next song on the album is called paler rider if i had to pick a favorite on the album it would be this one um it's one that just sticks in my head and really grips me just uh, some interesting notes i had written down when i listened to it for the first time um, just that I love the the combination of the strings and guitars in the opening. Um, the drums kind of like they feel like they're off, but they're not, which is always really interesting to me when you can pull that off. Um, just love the style of the song, gorgeous vocals. Um, but it twists into this part that 
you just wouldn't expect to come come from someone who sounds as sweet as Michelle does. And um, it's it just gets crazy, but it's a really memorable song. Let's hear what Michelle had to say about it. Paler Rider, uh, uh, you're, that's my favorite vocal from you on this album. Um, don't get me wrong, I, I enjoy them all, but that one is the one that um, as soon as I'm done listening to the album, I just go back and listen to Paler Rider again. Uh, what are your thoughts on that one? That seems to be like a, a shared um, a shared thought that it's um, some, everyone's kind of favorite. It's definitely one of my favorites and also Jerry's. The other members in the band seem to really uh, like that one also. Mm-hmm. And again, it was something that I I really enjoyed doing vocally because it was very raunchy and gnarly. And that's something that I, I feel I can do very well. And and especially on, on Paler Rider, along with other songs, I think Paler, Paler Rider really um, stands out on this album. Well, there's no doubt about that. She is absolutely right, at least from my experience. And, you know, I like all the songs. I genuinely like all the songs on this album very much. And uh, But I do have to say that's probably the one that I have listened to the most out of all of them, even though they're, they're all well worth listening to. But let's get Jerry's thoughts on this one. Let's talk about Paler Rider. Oh, Paler Rider. I love that song. Same. Same. Um, the strings and guitar opening is just beautiful. That was Dave's idea, the mm. strings. Yeah, he just, uh, I gave him the song and he, and uh, Tyler, the engineer, sent me like the, the stems and the tracks and he goes, well, you got to push back the beginning of the song because there's a string intro. So I had a lot of fun fitting it in and when it was done, I went, oh my God, this is so good, you know? It just holds up the suspense, builds up and then bang. Mm-hmm. But then it goes into a really odd direction. You don't expect drums like that. Uh, it really threw me off at first until I, I got drums, the groove yeah. of it. Yeah. Jazz drums. Yeah, I threw in jazz drums in there. Mm-hmm. A beat that I heard and I went, oh, I want that in there. So I just threw it in there, you know? It, it worked because really it was... well. It makes the song feel like it's off, but it's not. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I mean, the I, I think the... Uh, the main beat doesn't come on the on the one in the street mm-hmm. like they they're kind of random which is nice yeah that's what it felt like to me and uh it, and it really kind of drew me in in a way to where i i felt i don't know whether i should be following the drums or following everything else and i, I had to listen to the <laughs> song a couple of times to really be able to put it together because it's so different and unique but i love that me i i follow the vocals on that one to understand it that's what I would do. That's a good idea. But there's because just there. there's some great twists in it. You just you don't see the changes coming at all. Yeah, that that's for sure. Yeah. Now, and I, I thought I'd, I'd have I'd have uh, Michelle start the uh, one of the verses a cappella. Mm-hmm. You know, the, between the intro and the first verse, there's a silence there. And it's just Michelle going into the main chords. I I like that too, because I thought, you know, that's kind of like if I could equate it to a roller coaster, which is what this song really is. It's, it's kind of like, you know, when you're creeping towards the top and you just have that moment of breath before the car takes off. Yeah. Yeah. I get you. That's what that felt like, because you're, you're about to get into something that's very intense and unexpected. And uh, I, I I really just kind of envision that now when I hear the song. Now that that song 
it was created uh, with the uh, one of the writers of the apocalypse. Yeah, it's just it, it, to oh. me, and and I hate to so pick favorites, them, but, but I would have to say that, that that's it, probably the song that when the uh, album is over, I immediately go back and the, listen uh, to again. Uh, stereotype, cool. yeah, I love uh, that. generic. That's uh, my ringtone, uh, actually. Apocalypse writer, really? you know. <laughs> right. Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> Very nice. He sort of tries to see the errors of his way, but you know, he just disappears because he can't handle it. Mm. I, I, you know, that's that's a good twist in the story because normally they're just pretty vicious, don't care about anything. I've got a job to do, single minded purpose. Yeah, well, like I said the, uh, in the lyrics, he he had a lot of darkness to portray, sure. something like that, mm-hmm. uh, so, which leaves it uh, a bit of an ambiguity. Yeah, it's just it, it to me, and and I hate to pick favorites but i would have to say that that that's probably the song that when the album is over i immediately go back and listen to again cool yeah i love it that's Uh, my ringtone actually (laughs) is it really (laughs) yeah (laughs) very nice okay ladies and gentlemen i think that is a perfect time to wrap up this week's episode i'll be back next week with the second half of my review of the new era paxis album water dog with notes from Jerry and Michelle. I hope you guys have enjoyed it. This album is really fantastic. Go and check it out. It might be kind of interesting to kind of get your own take on it before you listen to next week's wrap up. And it might not. Up to you. But I would check it out if you like this kind of music. Uh, It's really something very unique and special. Really reminds me of the Colorado Springs music scene um, back in the the late 80s, early 90s, when uh, I was in a band there called Joker's Wild, playing with bands like Salem Spade, Least Majesty, Uh, some really great progressive stuff. Anyway, uh, next week will be the wrap up of this. The week after, I've got another amazing review of a very classic album that most of you will probably know and be familiar with. And then the following week, I have a very special interview that I have had to hold on to for legal reasons. And hopefully you'll tune in for that and enjoy it just as much. And I can already hear my voice is getting scratchy. See you next week, guys. Cheers. (laughs) 